Alpha. This is episode 158, and we have a very special guest. His name is Johnny Lynham. So Johnny is a seasoned real estate investor, entrepreneur, and CEO of Lynham Enterprises LLC and Heritage Property Partners LLC. So he started his real estate career in 2010 and has extensive experience in program and project management, operations, marketing, and negotiations. So Johnny has purchased 21 properties in the last five years in Alexandria, VA, Birmingham, Alabama, Mobile, Mobile, Alabama, and Panama City, uh, so Florida markets as well. So prior to his real estate career, Johnny served in the United States Air Force and is currently on his 15th year on active duty where he currently serves as the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. So Johnny holds a master's degree in business administration from TUI University, TUI University bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from the University of Alabama and financial planning and service certification from Northwestern University as well. And of course, you should get in contact with Johnny and uh, that's through personal Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, which is going to be, of course, in the show notes. So make sure to do that. And uh, Johnny, big thank you again for joining me on this episode. I really appreciate it. No problem at all, man. Glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you. It's my pleasure. And again, again, as I told you, thank you for the service and for the things that you're you know, doing currently in business and outside the business. So, you know, it, it's awesome. I'm very happy to have you on today. So can you take us to the point, uh, you know, how does that happen that, you know, 15 years, still active duty and military, how do you come across real estate? Um, I think the, the biggest thing is just making time for it and, you know, seeking it out, networking, you know, whether, you know, you're military or you're in the private sector, you know, networking and just talking about people about what it is that you're doing and what, what it is that you're looking for. And, uh, you know, and just leveraging a network for opportunity. Mm. That's so your personal journey, I mean, you know, do you, did you, like, did you came across somebody who was in the military that was like, man, you know, you should start investing in, in real estate. Or was there a book or an event? Because I know we kind of spoke with the, before I started recording, I mentioned the name like David Perret that I had on the show. So he's a really great guy. And like, how, like, where does that happen? Your personal journey? I mean, how did you get involved in a business like this? Yeah, so so really, and it started on the on the 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 military personal side. I had a good friend of mine, um, had been working in the Air Force about six months after being in college, and uh, a good friend of mine, Nick Battle, uh, he he came to me. He was like, "Hey man, I found this duplex. This guy's selling. I should buy one side. You should come on over and get the other side." And I was like, "Well, okay." And then he's like, "He's like the mortgage is gonna be like four hundred and fifty dollars, and I was paying like seven fifteen a month in rent." So I was like. Uh, okay, that's a, that's a no brainer. And, you know, and so that was the first thing I know my parents own their home and, uh, you know, having an electrical engineering degree, you didn't take that many business classes. So the finance side and, you know, looking at your interest rates and all that, that, that was still foreign to me, even though I had a, a four year degree, uh, that side was kind of lacking. And so went on I'm like, yeah, it makes sense. Use my VA loan. I actually got paid money at closing. Didn't have to bring any money to put any money down. Uh, with the VA loan program. And I'm like, hey, this is cool. They paid me to buy this house and I'm saving money. And, uh, you know, stayed in the house four years, relocated with uh, with the service moving me. And I kept it as a rental, brought on a property management company. And, uh, you know, to this day, that's been a little bit over 10 years ago. And uh, I've rolled by the house once in the last 10 years and it's been rented the entire time. I think we may have had a one month period in the last 10 years where it wasn't rented. And uh, yeah, you know, so that, that kind of started my way um, in regards to real estate. And after that, it was just rinse, repeat, you know, buy a house, find a foreclosure. We've been really successful with our transitions with finding foreclosures in the area, buying them with the VA loan. Um, our most recent one here in Panama City, we, we went the uh, kind of conventional route, um, but yeah, you know, and that it's just kind of been a snowball effect ever since then, that one decision and digging more and more in real estate, the investing side of it, learning more, picking up books. Um, I know a lot of people talk about rich dad, poor dad, but, you know, for me and my background, I didn't have that mindset. And I think that was the biggest thing with Robert Kiyosaki's book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. It gave me that mindset to look at the business, business side of things, the investor side of things and uh, continue just to build that knowledge over time. Mm. 
I'm wondering every time somebody mentions Rich Dad Poor Dad book, I'm like, how do people, everybody, how do everybody come across this book? You know, it's like the first book ever for the, for the people. So yeah. it's very interesting, you know, it's definitely a great book, you know, and, uh, you know, it's worth reading for somebody who didn't read it yet. So make sure to go and check it out. Again, as I mentioned, you know, having all the degrees in, you know, electrical engineering and what you did, again, financial planning, maybe that's uh, financial planning and service certification. So maybe that helps a little bit in the business side. But, uh, you know, serving actively 15 years, does that help you? And maybe you can talk about the points that kind of help you to build a business that you can take from military and, you know, apply those in business side. Most definitely. Uh, it, it, it came to the point um with me and my career which I, I do acquisitions which is a non-typical um career field in the military uh, when you think about you know guns and bullets and fighting and everything and operational strategy but um pretty much you buy you buy goods on behalf of the government and so with that you pick up the skills negotiation uh you know project management um leading diverse teams in order to accomplish you know whether you're developing software or, or buying uh, some piece of equipment and, uh, you know, it got to the point where you was like, okay, yeah, stocks, you know, it's, it's, it's slowing over time. And my dad was an entrepreneur. So, it, you know, even when I was in college, I would buy different things, you know, get money from my refund check and we'll go and go to the flea market or trade post and buy things, come back on campus and sell it, make, you know, make additional cash and things like that. And uh, for me, being able to negotiate deals in the military doing my daytime job lead projects that was like hey you know you see these fix and flips people with houses we love real estate we're living in a foreclosure that we bought is going up in value it's like hey let's buy a fix and flip project and uh you know i got the skills i work with contractors with people on a daily basis and it's like it's just a different type of contractor to do the renovation work and uh and, you know, and I took, we took a bet on ourselves. I say we with my wife that uh, she was right there with me and, you know, had the faith in me that we could do it. And we kind of took that leap. And with that, we, we had to build a business. We did one, our first flip uh, in Alexandria, Virginia, when we were stationed there and uh, learned a lot of lessons, you know, had a pool, had to get renovated, had mold remediation because of the foreclosure had been sitting for multiple years. And so we had a great team. I had an architect that was my general contractor. And Nailu, she led me through so much of the business of building back a house from the studs up that I didn't have that experience, but hey, I know how to manage and I know how to pick the right people and leverage their expertise in order to bring all the different parts together to, to complete the project. And that kind of is, is what we've done. And you know, from there, we, we sold that one. And then we started uh, investing at a distance doing the fix and flip. Uh, about 10 hours away in Birmingham, Alabama, where my wife is from, just because of the price point, the cost of construction was a whole lot cheaper than the Northern Virginia area. And uh, put the systems in place, you know, leveraged our network and just kind of did onesie twosie over the next couple of years and kind of led us to, you know, last year where we got to the point where we did nine projects in, in one year. Um, and uh, it's kind of just taken a life of its own over the last two years. So. Mm -hmm. It's been good, but I couldn't have done it without the background and having that confidence in myself yeah. from just the experience that the, the military afforded me. Yeah, that's great. So, again, I, I love the fact that you're, you know, creating those systems and implementing those systems so we can kind of do this business, you know, remotely. And I'm sure and we can, of course, go into details, you know, how do you actually look at those deals happening? You know, when it comes through, maybe through some online type of system. So we can talk about that a little bit, of course. But first, I want to ask you like your personal process that you go about and let's say vet a potential contractor that's going to do that, you know, kind of all the renovation side of, of the deal. How do you go about to find a great one? You know, cause there's a lot of real estate investors are struggling with finding a good contractor. So what's your take on that? Yeah, most definitely uh, referrals. Number one, you know, getting referrals and that's the, the good ones. A lot of times the investors, they don't want to share them because they're using them, um, you know, but referrals are definitely number one. And for me, uh, you know, I started off with just home advisor. I found my first GC, uh, Nailu, a home advisor. I talked to two or three. She was really good. She was an architect before. And I knew I needed to leverage someone with that experience to come in to kind of help round the corners and help us kind of fill in the gaps of what I didn't know uh, with, the, with, with that type of project. But we had to do it all over again when we transitioned to another market. And so the first project uh, went down. 
I had, you know, from sheetrock, I had roofers, I had air condition. And so I literally just Craigslist uh, going down. Now a lot of people use Facebook Marketplace, but Craigslist and I went down for a weekend and just got bids from random contractors and, uh, you know, got references. And I kind of put the team together on the fly. And so with that one, I felt a little bit more comfortable with the process. So I could hire my own roofer, I could hire my own plumber, I could hire my own handyman to do the sheetrock paint for those trades. And uh, and you put a team together. But luckily, I'll say we were blessed here with uh, once we got started with the fix and flip business here in Panama City, Florida, we found a great uh, guy that could facilitate. He had all the right connections with all the different trades to come in. And with the nine projects we done last year, they were the lead on every one of them. So we didn't have to really build additional relationships. And we still working to this day right now with the projects that we're doing here in this area. So, you know, you just got to get out, meet other investors, you know, and it's a lot of trial and error. We've had to get rid of some contractors when we first started on guys didn't work out that, uh, you know, they did on one job then, but they weren't consistent with the next job. You know, they kind of, their, uh, their craftsmanship kind of fell back and, there's a lot of dynamics, you know, when you start talking about contractors, you know, they may not get paid for one job, then all the guys leave because they didn't get paid. And, you know, they, they're they trying to navigate that. So it's a, it's, a whole, it's a whole lot that goes into it. But once you get a good contractor, man, do whatever you can to keep them, make it a win-win situation for, for both you and them to keep them on your team because uh, they're, they're your lifeblood. Mm -hmm. So would you consider like general contract is kind of the most important piece in a business? Because again, if we talk about these systems, and of course, there is different angles that we can look at this business from, you know, like, let's say place of, you know, fixing the property, again, the online systems and, you know, transfer systems, like there's different things involved. But would you consider like, you know, GC is the main piece in your business, so we can scale it like to to currently have 21 properties or or is there something else that kind of you know, like attributed to your success to that? Yeah, no, I, I think they definitely are the uh, the most important piece because you look at the the budget that you execute. Uh, they're they're right behind there. They're the ones that's doing the work, so they're they're not good with their numbers. They're doing you're having overruns. They're eating into your profit, and if they're taking too long, they eat into your schedule, which drives your profit, and uh, they can just make it make your make your life a nightmare. And for me especially if you're not hands-on with doing the work yourself, then you got to have somebody dependable that, that knows what needs to be done and getting it done. And so I think that's the, the biggest thing that, uh, you know, everybody else, you know, you can find an attorney that can do the closing. You can find a realtor that can, you know, find deals or, you know, that can get the property sold, which we don't, we, we actually do flat fee uh, listings on MLS where we just play a fat flea, a flat fee. <laughs> and, uh, and get them listed for when the ones that we actually sell and don't keep. And, uh, you know, so those pieces you can, you can work within, but yeah, definitely having a great contractor is the most important piece. Uh, with executing to, uh, to make sure you stay profitable because you can, if you have, you know, bad contractors, they can drive, they can definitely drive a deal down where that it's not as great of a deal as you thought when you initially purchased it. So. Mm -hmm. Here you go. Okay, so that's a solid advice, and definitely it's, it's one of the kind of the most important piece when it comes to acquisitions and making sure when it comes to value that type of process. Like, did you having the right GC first of all, finding right GC as you mentioned through networking, you know, asking for referrals, those type of things. So when once that done, like it's all about the managing the property, which I, I as far as I understand, heritage heritage properties property partners LLC, that's the management company that you have, right? Yep. So yeah, Heritage is a little unique. That was the company that I stood up when we purchased our first multifamily. We purchased the 18 unit here in Panama City um, earlier this year. And so instead of using the LLC line of enterprises, you know, where we uh, we do all our fix and flips, that we stood up another uh, entity to to take on that project. And so that's where Heritage Property Partners is, is coming on board. And I brought partner up with uh, my guy, Rory Compton who's a part of the team and, you know, we took that property down together and right now, you know, continuing to grow and looking at different things here in the North Carolina market and the uh, Virginia market um, mm -hmm. on the multifamily side. And uh, so that, but with, with everything else, you know, talking about systems and businesses that our portfolio, that uh, those properties that we chose not to sell, that we're keeping as rentals, that uh, we, we pass those off to a third party property management company here in Panama City. 
Mm -hmm. uh, we still manage some of the out of state properties like the one in Mobile, the one in Northern Virginia. We do those on ourselves. And, um, but they're, they're a little bit less, you still have your team that you can tap into. My wife doesn't work. So she's kind of the, the brains behind that operation where is that, Hey, they just pick up the phone call or, Hey, we need a plumber, you know, Hey, this happened. We need uh, somebody to come look at the refrigerator or whatever it is. So it's not that intrusive on my time. Um, so I can leverage her time to, you know, make those relations and then, you know, bring her on to where is that on the tax strategy side. Now she's a real estate professional because, you know, she's spending those hours during the year doing those real estate transactions. And so that gives you, I'm not a CPA. So talk to your CPA, but having a real estate professional designation allows you to do more with the passive income deductions and losses that you can bring into mm -hmm. supplementing or reducing your active income. Yeah. with just how the, our tax code is set up. So that that's def something, something definitely that we do. So it's a mixed bag, but primarily you want to have a system in place, lean on a third party to do your property management so you can treat it as a business and free mm -hmm. up your time to find more opportunities uh, for it and um, find better investments for the future. So. Got it. So the Heritage Property Partners LLC is just a separate LLC entity for this 18 unit multifamily deal. And you, you're actively now looking to acquire more deals again in different states. And of course, we need to talk about that transitioning from single family to commercial type of real estate properties. But the question that I want to ask you about this 21 properties that, you know, you, you purchased. Uh, so th those are the single family houses, right? Correct. Yeah. Yep. And one, one, I think we, we have one duplex that's caught up in there that we yeah. have. Yeah. So can you tell people, I mean, when it comes to managing these type of properties, because I'm sure there are some people who will be looking towards single family houses. And I know there is quite a few actually multifamily, you know, investors that are looking towards now single family houses, because, you know, that's where the, that, that that's where the funds are looking at at the same time. So it makes uh, like from a time frame standpoint and from an investment standpoint for those people, you know, to diversify the efforts and go into single family and to grow portfolio to, let's say, 100 or, you know, or 200 houses, depending on, you know, if scalability of the system in place and the network and the capital for them to do that and just to sell it off to the funds for probably a good kind of cap rate and good, you know, uh, you know, good profit. But uh, talking about the management part, like, can you tell again, same as a GC about the vetting process? How do you go about to find the right property management for your single family houses? Yeah, and so it's, it, it starts kind of on the GC route with uh, referrals, other investors, um, you know, understanding their experience that they've had with the companies. Um, here most recently, so on the multifamily side, I took on the property management role uh, since July when we took down the property, whereas that I wanted to get experience on the multifamily side with uh, taking the pro property over, taking over the contracts, leases, and getting experience for that in order to give me more uh, perspective with looking at future deals on and being able to work with a property manager and kind of hone my skills as an asset manager at that point, you know, where we have multiple multifamily. But it's the same on a single family side, where is that you want to understand, hey, how, how do you do your maintenance? Uh, can I use my, for me, since I have a, my business is uh, fix and flips, can I leverage my existing uh, relationships with my plumbers, my air condition, my handyman in order to service my properties? Because once you buy a real a piece of property, the largest cost is the maintain maintenance that you have to carry over the years. So it can eat into your cash flow if your maintenance cost is, you know, goes up 50% because your, your property management company has just an expensive vendor that does all their work and you're paying for that out of pocket, it can really eat into your, your profit. And so the biggest thing for me was being able to have control over the maintenance piece to have say in that, which was good. And then being able to negotiate the, uh, the monthly fee uh, was the biggest two factors for us in order to, you know, to have a company because, you know, they all kind of work within the market and, you know, um, I'll say some mom, mom and pop property management companies don't have a lot of technology and software. And so I think that was another one too, that most of the ones that we talked to, they had it, but the reports and the reporting to me, whereas that I can get weekly reports and I can dive into the numbers and see negative trends early, whereas that I can work with the property management team to make corrections, um, to understand what's going on with the rents, the leases, the time to lease when we have turnover and things like that was very important. And so the property manager, when I had the interview, was very uh, knowledgeable 
and uh, the, t the draft reports that I viewed were on par with what I need to see in order to make, make good decisions to be able to properly manage the, our, our single family portfolio and our multifamily. Got it. Okay. So um, talking about the property management side, I mean, have you had any issues when it comes to rent, uh, rent collections? Because if you're watching this episode, it's uh, 7th of November, actually, we're now still during the COVID. So, I mean, have you had any issues? And if you had, how, how your property management uh, was able to resolve these issues when it comes to rent collection? Yep. So as a whole, so looking at the, the 18 unit that we purchased and then our uh, single family portfolio, that I think combining those together that we're probably around the 90% uh, collection for the collection rate on uh, available rents. And uh, we've had, so we've had uh, a couple of tenants. So our, our 18 unit was a C-class, more working class type of property. And so we've had some tenants that were impacted by COVID, uh, whether it was a, you know, lost a job or, uh, you know, some just like, hey, they came in contact with somebody that had COVID so they couldn't work for two weeks type of deal. And, uh, you know, if you're depending on tips, then you're not really getting a lot of tips if you're not working for two weeks. So things like that, whereas that, uh, excuse me, that we had those impacts. But what I found is there's a lot of resources at the local government level that have stepped in to help people in those positions. And so the biggest thing was just really, you know, talking to other investors and seeing, hey, what organizations are helping the community. And so we've had a couple of people that uh, that leverage local charities to help catch them up on their rent and uh, and things like that. And we've you know helped people where they apply a portion of their uh, security deposit to cover rent or you know broke it up. Whereas that hey you know we'll we'll add this on the back end where you can catch up you know once you get back your employment back. So things like that. But I think at the end of the day, it's just the tenants. You know once you take down, we talked about the importance of the GC in the process to get the property and bring it online and get it renovated. But your tenants, they are they are the the most important piece. Once you actually take the property is renovated, you move someone in, your tenants are what, what keeps the lights on and pays the bills. You know, so really for me, it was uh, you know, being able to relate to them as people and understand, you know, the life stressors and you know everything with COVID is going on is dynamic. And so I think really just being able to not, you know, hide behind a phone that, you know, that I would literally, I'm in uniform, leaving work, stop by the property in the evening. You know, if I have to talk to somebody that admit them pay rent on time, it's just like having a one-on-one -on -one conversation, understanding what's going on. And there, cause most people, you know, they don't, they want to pay their bills. Um, but if they're not in a position, they may be afraid to talk about it or embarrassed to talk about, you know, life challenges that they're experiencing. But I think being one-on-one -on -one with un understanding situations with people and letting them know, hey, we're going to help you get through this and being flexible. I think that goes a long way. And I think that's one of the things that helped us with our property um, thus far through COVID. Mm -hmm. Got it, got it. Good, okay. So 90% um, and up, you know, that's what you're probably having when it comes to sets of the rent collections. Good, so, okay. So now transitioning to the multifamily side of it and you kind of a little bit mentioned, again, tax purposes, ability to scale, you know, so those type of things, which is uh, just a few you know, mentioning, talking about when it comes to multifamily investing, but when it comes to the deal yep, size, me? please. Okay. Yeah. I lost you there for a second. Uh, no, no, no worries. Yeah. So again, we like what I mentioned, moving on to multifamily side of it and, you know, ability to scale uh, in your tax, tax, uh, tax wise, you know, to able to, to do some tax deductions, tax write-offs, appreciation, depreciation. So like, can you talk about the deals besides what you have in right now, the 18 unit property, what do you have currently in the pipeline and what type of deals, like how big of the deals are you going to be looking for to close? Um, so right now um, on the multifamily side, we're still doing the single family. Uh, we have a couple under contract there. Um, so that business is still going, but on the multifamily side, we're looking at really 20 to 50 unit, um, primarily right now, in North Carolina and Virginia. Uh, we, we got a, negotiation going on a property now 32 unit um in north carolina and i gotta go back we got a counter from the to the owner and uh, we're gonna go through and kind of formulate our response back to him mm -hmm. so that's kind of the sweet spot 20 to 50 um working with mom and pop owners and usually most of them are self-managing uh and really just c-class type properties working class uh properties that need to have value add situations where you know they have deferred maintenance where we can come in and make improvements and, and raise rents over time. 
and usually with us, you know, um, we're, we're usually targeting anywhere from two to five years for us the whole time on the multifamily side. So that's kind of what we're looking at. And, um, you know, and that's a combination of my virtual assistant, you know, doing cold calling, we're doing some direct mail. And then of course, building relationships with brokers in those areas in order to, uh, to generate the deal flow. And how are you planning to structure those deals? So is it gonna be like traditional syndication type of 506B or C or is it gonna be JV deals? Yep. Yep. So we're, we're definitely looking to syndicate. So more of a general partner, limited partner uh, relationship. The one unique thing on the, uh, the 18 unit that we purchased, we actually raised the, the, a portion of the down payment via notes. So we maintain the equity and then we brought on investors to, uh, to take on second, second position debt for two years. And uh, it ended up working out to be a, uh, a, a 17% IR. Um, per year for those two years for them um, after we kick in some of the equity after we refinance at the two year mark. So that's, we, we were, we did some creative stuff there. My first one, I read it. I was like, you know, you know, now I was like, dude, you wrote, you raised notes. You like, you, you didn't give them equity. I was like, well, you know, I was like, Hey, I, I wanted to keep this property long-term and, you know, so maintain uh, as much equity as possible. So I was like, okay, I just raised notes to bring in half of my down payment. I'll pay the other half myself. And, and go from there. So that was unique, but we're definitely looking at a, a general partner, limited partner partnership. Um, our target return for our investors is 8% cash on cash is, you know, it's kind of the magic number we try to give them. And then we, uh, we usually shoot between for 15 to 20% internal rate of return IRR for those deals. Uh, and um, like I mentioned, you know, most of those like that, when we're coming to the GP LP, um, kind of construct that we shoot for uh, our business plan is five years. Mm -hmm. Got it. So can you take us back again through the states and um, decision making process on why you're planning to invest in the states when it comes to multifamily? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is just the uh, appreciation is always there. But uh, for me, it's the, the passive income, the cash flow uh, is the thing that uh, that drives me. And it's not so much much the actual dollar figure, but for me, it's the freedom. Whereas that generating enough passive income to uh, pay off, pay my monthly expenses, and then it just gives you the freedom to you know spend time with your family, your kids, for me, or to travel the world and um, just in, and build those life experiences with uh, your loved ones. That a lot of people it's hard to do when you're working 50, 60 hours, and uh, it just makes it you know life is hard. And so that's the thing that, that I've picked up with, you know, over the years with the power of real estate and, it, and the com compound effect with multifamily compared to single family, you can do it a whole lot faster by having the economy of scale with having multiple doors at a single location. You may have 16 units all with just one roof versus having 16 single family homes that may be all over town with all 16 different roofs and things like that, whereas that you have a lot of economy of scale, you have one parking lot, and uh, you can have one maintenance man that can service the whole area. You can have a property management company that can just focus all the units. So they only go to one place to show units for you. So there's a lot of economy scale that is had with multifamily. And as you get bigger, you can have on-site property management, on-site maintenance full-time with the larger units. But I like to tell a lot of people, you know, from where I started, uh, you don't need a whole, you don't need a, a hundred units or a thousand units to, uh, to retire successfully. You know, you can even just get an eight plex, you know, get two, four units over 15 years and pay them off. And when it's time for you to retire, you know, you can be generating, you know, five, six thousand dollars of uh, passive income each month that you can use that, you know, you don't have to generate, you know, 20 tens and 20, 30,000 each month. A type of deal. If you want to, you can build a business or you can build a portfolio over the years to get there, but you don't have to um, in order to be successful. And so that's one of the things I like to educate a lot of people that you can. You can have a strategy with a single family or on the smaller side with multifamily that you can take advantage of the, the tax incentives, the appreciation, mm -hmm. the cash flow, and, uh, you know, and be successful, you know, but it's all about, hey, you know, identifying your goal, you know, figuring out what it is for you that you're going after, and then just finding a mentor to or someone that can help you build that roadmap to, to get to success for you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when it comes to your own personal business goals, uh, I mean, 21, you know, properties on a kind of single family home side, 18 units currently on multifamily. So do you have a magic, magical number 
let's say for this or for upcoming year, I don't know how, how far ahead you're actually planning your, you know, your business kind of moves and goals. But what is the magical number that you have when it comes to assets on the management for, for single family or multifamily? Uh, I really don't have a magic number for me. It's on the single family side, it's building a successful, uh, you know, renovation business. So for me, it's, it's all passive because I still work. I'm still have my daytime job. Whereas that if we do five properties or if we do 15 properties this year, you know, it's fine because it's just going to continue to build into the multifamily um, and get to the freedom. And so for me, it's take action, do as much as I can for the next five years leading up to 20 years. And, you know, that's kind of the fork in the road like, hey, do I want to retire or do I want to keep going? And so I'm kind of just seeing, you know, having fun, building the business, um, educating investors you know, partnering up with investors on the multifamily side and just growing organically, you know, so I don't, I don't have a set number of, you know, cause I think a lot of times you can get overly aggressive and chase deals. And so that's one thing that we're looking at to where is that, Hey, if it's a deal, the numbers work and uh, it makes sense, then, Hey, we'll, we'll figure out a way and we're going to get it done. And, uh, you know, continuing to grow, uh, as far as I'm concerned, you know, right now, um, I've met, all my, I've met all my goals from a passive income perspective. Um, I think the next multifamily will put me in a position where is that I'll have enough passive income that can cover my expenses. And so, you know, now it's just, you know, everything else is a bonus. And so I, I don't think I'm, I'm not really chasing a number right now. But it's really just doing the best I can and uh, growing my business to where is that when I get to, you know, the 20 year mark that I can really kind of assess, hey, wh wh what do I want to do next? I, I got time to build this. If I want to go coach my son's you know, sports team or my daughter's sports team, I can do that. I can travel during the summer with them. You know, just that's the thing that I'm chasing is that freedom. Got it. So of course, you know, those things maybe sometimes can change too. So when we're going to have Johnny back on the show again, you know, a couple of years later, he's going to be like, hey, look, I just closed on a 2000, you know, you know, units kind of count, you know, this year, because you look, it's a process. And sometimes you don't know, of course, like uh, what you're saying, it doesn't take a lot for people to kind of get fun that financial freedom and to make sure that the properties can cover the expenses as you give the example, this, you know, four, uh, uh, two, two, four plex, you know, type of deals. And, you know, you can be kind of well off just from that, but it grows, you know, and part of that growth is, is, you know, growing yourself personally and mentally. And again, you mentioned the coaches. So, so can you talk about, cause of course, uh, everybody have those type of days where you just like, everything goes well and it's something happens, you know, things don't go well as planned and, you know, whatever stuff happens. So when it comes to a personal growth, how do you continue to innovate and grow yourself personally? And maybe you can give some advice if it's a, you know, YouTube content, cause I know you have your own shows and, like, how do you consume information, you know, during these times? Yeah, most definitely. And I think you get, you got to have that foundation where is that you, uh, wherever you're getting your inspiration. For me, um, with my story, I kind of found uh, Eric Thomas, uh, E.T., the hip hop preacher, mm -hmm. um, was one of the influencers, I think, on that side. My dad, who was a, who was a, who was a minister, kind of my faith and, you know, my beliefs with uh, Christianity and and being and believing in Jesus Christ, that kind of grounded me a lot. And so I, before I kind of took off and I told you, you know, we'd done the nine properties last year that uh, throughout the whole process of that, we had just came, we, we were displaced for six months after a hurt, category five hurricane here in Panama City, um, got back, got two properties under contract, getting it going for those nine and I tore my ACL and I had to have knee surgery in the middle of all that and, you know, going around on crutches, you know, to view properties, but I had systems in place. I had the team and, you know, so just really that motivation, you know, being able to read, you know, read continuously the books on, you know, on just the trade craft of, of doing real estate and leaning on my network, you know, the, having, having positive people in your life with, especially your spouse, your close network of friends, and uh, that's been instrumental for the, the mental aspect. And I think being around other people that's looking to do the same thing as you, you know, mastermind group. As I mentioned, I'm part of David Ferre, who was a great guy that was on your show, uh, part of his mastermind group. And, you know, having that band of brothers, if you will, is, is key, you know, because some people, they've already gone through what you're going through. They can tell you, hey, it's not that bad. You're going to get through it. 
hey, hang in there. And so being able to have that resource is, uh, is paramount or having a mentor, you know, one-on-one relationship that with someone that's been in the space that you're looking to be in and is successful and been there, done that, that they can help you kind of navigate those pitfalls where you don't make a lot of the same mistakes that they made. And so I think that, you know, that leaning on your network, having the right people around you is, is super critical in order to be successful. But at the end of the day, you got to, you know, whatever your faith is, your beliefs, that system to go, that motivation and being able to look in the rearview mirror on, hey, what have you come through up until this point? And just know your life experience has built you and put you in a position where is that whatever's in front of you, you can go through it because you've overcame everything in your past that was put in, put in front of mm-hmm. you. So you know, don't give up on yourself now, continue to maintain that faith in yourself and, uh, and just, hey, build and have the resources to tap into around you so you can yeah. maintain that good work-life balance. Here you go. And that's a great message. So, so now I know why you're listening to ET and, and that comes <laughs> out. That comes out. <laughs> that is awesome. So uh, again, um, so, so you're doing great things. I mean, when it comes to, again, you know, it's serving your country, you know, and, and, and making sure that you provide for the family, for the people around you, creating safe, you know, environments for the people that live in, live in your properties and the communities and, you know, continue to build your business and innovate yourself and grow as a person. So my last question that I have for you, beside, you know, having family and taking care of the family and making sure that they're more than fine, what is the personal legacy that you want to leave behind you? Well, I, I think the, for me, the personal legacy is leaving uh, my kids in a position where is that they can do whatever they want to do in life and chase their dreams and don't have to worry about a job you know, or how they're going to pay their bills. And I think leaving that, that legacy and ability behind, and I think for me, you know, building a YouTube channel, this, this is like, if something, God forbid, happens to me, I want my kids to know where I stood on certain things and I want to be able to give them all this content, everything, the experience that I've built up. I look at, Hey, the media content that I put out, they can go and look at that and like, Hey, this is what dad was about. You know, this is what dad was done. And just, you know, and give them the opportunity to chase their dreams, you know, wherever their heart leads them and where they want to go. I want to be able to give them an opportunity like my parents did. You know, and they, you know, the sacrifices that my parents made in order to put me into college and to motivate me and to give me that mindset that, you know, I can be successful at whatever it is that I do. Um, I think it was just, it was, it was, it was, uh, it was game changing for me in my life, you know. So shout out to them, my parents, man, you know, Johnny and Ruth, they, they invested a lot in me. And so now I'm doing the same thing for my family and for others. And I think there's a lot of people that's, you know, they hate their jobs, you know, they, they hate waking up going to work, you know, so my, my goal is to not only just don't be selfish and just help my family, you know, but be in a position to put it out there and, and try to help others kind of grow themselves and be the best CEOs of their last name, as I like to say, in order to continue to help other people build generational wealth. Awesome, awesome. That's a great message. So I appreciate you sharing that. And again, guys and girls, one thing that I wanted to ask you before we're going to go, if you enjoyed this message, of course, make sure to pass this along to your friend, to a friend of yours, uh, that person who is looking to get that motivation, strategy, inspiration, tips on how to get involved with the real estate investing passively, actively. There's a lot of great, great pieces on this episode. So make sure to, to go and do that. Again, and for more information, go and get in contact with uh, Johnny himself on Instagram, uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube. You're going to find these links down below. And of course, opinvestnow.com. That's the website for you to go and check as well. So, uh, Johnny, I, I want to say big thank you again for coming over today and sharing all these great tips, strategies, tools. I mean, it's awesome. So really appreciate your time today. Awesome. No problem at all, brother. And hopefully after this COVID stuff blows over, man, and we're, we're traveling over that way, man, to stop in and visit you. Here you go. And, and that's, live, that's been live recorded on this podcast. So it has to happen now. Nice. <laughs> Here you go. Awesome. For sure. So I appreciate it again for coming over today, Johnny. It's been a great fun. Guys and girls, make sure to pass this episode along. And as always, I'll see you next time. Thank you for watching.